whenever I gather with God's people, it seems that those doubts become less. You ever experience that? It's amazing when the only voice you hear is your own voice, the only voice you hear starts to sound a little crazy. You ever found that to be true? Like, you, know, you always wonder, you ask yourself, or maybe I'm the only one, but you ask yourself questions like, am I going nuts? And usually if you're asking that question, the implied answer is, yeah, probably, maybe even a little, but, but certainly there's, there's some aspect of that. Um, but doubt sometimes, especially in the life of faith, can really ruin our lives, can it? But the reality is, is that doubt is a part of faith. Doubt is not separate from faith. In fact, doubt itself is an act of faith. You're like, no, wait, I thought doubt was opposite of faith. You have faith, and, and what I was taught was faith is believe. You've just got to believe it. Hmm, that's always been a problem for me. I don't like that. And I know some people can just hear something and believe it. You, you, maybe you grew up in the church and you heard the gospel stories and you just believe it. And for those of you that are like that, I, I think, I don't, know, I don't know if I envy you or if I pity you. I think it's a little bit of both, honestly, because I've never been able to just believe something just because it was told me. I wish I could at times. But then there's other times where my curiosity and my questions, we can call that doubt if you'd like, um, have led to incredible personal discoveries that, that, that transform my way of thinking, that transform my life. And so for me, I think the act of doubt, the act of questioning something is actually an act of faith. I, my way of questioning is a way of seeking truth. And if I'm seeking truth, isn't that an evidence of faith? So I want, I, I want to invite the ability to doubt into the sanctuary of God's presence. I think it's okay. I think it's okay to ask questions. And, and I'm not talking about the questions that we ask just to push buttons. <laughs> uh, mothers, right, on this Mother's Day, do you, do you recognize those questions when they come at you? Like, you know, you know the difference. I don't even need to quantify it. You know the difference. You know when you have some little pipsqueak son that looks a lot like me, sounds a lot like me, standing in your kitchen, needling you with questions. You know it's not for your edification or for their, ex their exploration of truth, right? It is precisely to see just how long it's going to take before the belt comes off. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what it's for. I remember doing this with my dad. My dad... Um, is the most loving, mild-mannered, easygoing guy in the world. He genuinely is, until he's not. <laughs> and we went to a church in Colorado, um, uh, Southgate Church of the Nazarene, when my dad was out there going to school. And uh, they had a front lot and they had a back lot. And the back lot was a one-way access point, right? So when church was letting in in the morning, all the cars went one direction. You packed, parked in the back 40. And then when, when you got out for service, all the cars would go the opposite direction, all through this narrow entryway. And we hadn't made it out of the parking lot. And I was needling my dad with questions precisely to cause a reaction. And they did cause a reaction after several warnings. The problem was is the reaction happened right when we were in that choke spot. And I remember our van, our minivan, was the only vehicle in that one-way area. And all of the cars behind us were waiting to get out. And my dad stopped the car and he said, get out. <laughs> get out. And I was like, what? You know, what? What are you going to do? And... Uh, uh, what he was going to do was take me to the back of the van, hands on the van, while his belt came off in the, front, in, in the presence of God and all of the witnesses, my friends included. And that was the Sunday I had sent one of those notes, you know, check yes or no to the girl sitting next to me. And she witnessed my pu public flogging, right? Doubt. Um, doubt. There's a difference in the type of questions we ask. And doubt, that is an act of faith, are the right questions seeking the right answers. Um, but doubt still is a reality. Um, we've talked about this the past few weeks. We've talked about how do we deal with doubt and division. We've talked about 
Um, how do we deal with, with even the doubt of, uh, of the questions that trouble us uh, specifically, you know, or at night or, or, or when our minds are troubled? But today, um, I want to deal with doubt in the Bible. Hmm. You ever doubt the Bible? Oh, man. Yeah. There's no reason to doubt Scripture except sometimes when you read it, you go, wait a second. I love these words. I do. I love these words. I write in these pages. Um, my Bible is in bad shape. It has been hot glued. It has been, uh, it has been, pages have been reinserted, hopefully in the right place. Otherwise than that, it'll mess up my theology. Um, right? This, this Bible has seen some stuff, but honestly, some of the the, the where it has experienced are those moments when I've wrestled with it, not when I've loved it, but when I've wrestled with it. And here's the problem I find in the church when it comes to the Bible, is we declare this as truth, and it is, but we declare it as truth apart from Christ. This is a book. The Word of God is not a book. The Word of God is Jesus. Amen. This is a book. It's a good book. It's a holy book. It's a book to live our lives by. But apart from Jesus, it's a book and nothing more. It's words on a page. And let me speak candidly, bluntly, because I think we've done a disservice sometimes We sometimes justify the Bible to the people outside of the church when the Bible was never in intended for the people outside the church. The Bible was intended for the church, and the church is intended for the world. Hmm. Did you know the Bible is not an evangelistic tool? Handing someone a Bible and say, read it and get saved is not a good strategy. It's just not. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I've got my Gideon Bible I, from when I was a kid. I remember as a kid, speaking of doubt, I remember as a kid finding those passages I knew were underlined in my parents' Bible and in a, in a fit of rage, tearing those specific pages out of my Bible in front of my parents just to tick them off. Right? I'm that kid. <laughs> um, I remember, I've still got that Bible, pages reinserted. Um, and, and can I say, we have treated the Bible outside of the church as the way, the front door to the church, and it's just not. It is just not. And there are people in the world and sometimes people in our pews that have questions that we have ignored because we're afraid to own parts of the Bible that are just there. I love quoting Bible verses that no one else quotes. I love that. You know, there's, there's a great one in Ezekiel. I won't tell you where. You can find it. But it, it deals with uh, donkeys and horses and their, sometimes their, um, their view to each other and what transpires. It's weird. Like, that's in the Bible. Song of Solomon, in the Bible. Whoo, I should preach that. Um, totally there. Dance of Mannheim, right? It's, it, it's in the Bible. Um, uh, it's it, things in Genesis. They, wow. Um, one of my favorite verses in the, in, in the Old Testament, and the man and the woman were naked and felt no shame, right? It's in the Bible. You're like, you can't say that. And I'm quoting scripture, Genesis 2.25. Um, uh, uh, Galatians 5.12, I wish those agitators would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. That's in the Bible. Love the Bible, right? It's in the Bible. We need to own all of the Bible, all of the Bible. How about the story where the, the lady uh, woos the uh, general, the wicked general, to sleep with a glass of warm milk? Remember that story? You're like, what are you talking about? Yeah, the, the general comes in. She, she plays nice. She makes a bed for him. She gives him some warm milk and says, here, take a nap. And as soon as he was asleep, she drove a tent peg through his temple. Didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> that probably won't fit on a T-shirt. <laughs> But I'd sure like to try, right? We've got to own all of it. We've got to own all of it. And can I, without, without placating, without pacifying what could, what could turn on me very quickly, can I say sometimes 
the Bible seems to contradict itself. Woo. Like, you don't say that in church. Because what we're going to do is we're going to put points on the screen to show you how it doesn't. And let's be honest, sometimes it does. Mm. We've got to own that. You're like, no, 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 give me one instance. So glad you didn't ask. So glad, so glad. Um, and, and I don't know that these are contradictions, but we've got to own it. The resurrection narratives. Was there one angel at the tomb? Or were there two? Well, it depends on where you read. I know it's different perspectives. I understand that. But we say, well, it's the word of God. It's without error. We say that. And then we read that and we go quickly past it. You see, does it matter to the story? Not even a little. Does it change the theology? Not, uh, not even in the smallest amount. Or maybe it was a cultural thing. You know, they, they weren't as, oh, how pompous can we say this? They weren't as evolved as we are. They didn't know the stuff that we know. Oh, C.S. Lewis calls, calls this chronological snobbery, snobbery, where we think because we are, we are later in, in life that we can look back at our ancestors and just think, well, they were just stupid chronological snobbery, and we do that sometimes, but the, the fact of the matter is, is the sciences were not as developed. The Bible gets science wrong. It just does. It's not a science book. It never was intended to be. You remember Joshua, Joshua 10, the day the earth stood still? It's not a movie. It could be a movie, but not that one, right? Uh, there, was, there was this prayer. They were fighting this battle. Joshua said, asked God to stop the sun, and, and God did it. They completed the battle. Um, well, if, if the Bible is without error, we would need to go in and correct that and say, no, the, earth, the sun did not stop. The earth did. It's not a science book. It's not the point of it. It was never meant to do that, you see. But we've got to own these things. We can't just look past them and pretend that they're not there, these facts that plague us. And sometimes we, we've got to have permission to ask questions of Scripture itself without worrying that we're going to offend someone or that we're going to get very defensive. If we believe that the Bible is for the world, contrary to the point I just made, then we've got to own all of it and be ready to talk about all of it without being defensive and offensive. Um, so sometimes, sometimes we read things and we wonder, we wonder, did that really happen that way? Because sometimes, let's be honest, the this, this story seems too incredible that God, God of wonders beyond our galaxy, that God would become small enough to fit in utero in a woman's womb. Doesn't that seem unbelievable? And I'm not saying we question this. I'm not saying that that is in doubt. What I'm saying is sometimes the story is so unbelievable that we need to step back and, and, and with new eyes examine it with fresh faith. Um, I, believe, I believe the word of God is true. I believe it is right. I believe the word of God is a story that shapes us. And I believe the word of God is the manner in which the kingdom of God is to look. We, as the people of God, are to look like what the Bible is talking about. But there's even parts of the Bible we don't, we don't follow in our churches, aren't there? I mean, we'll quote verses out of Leviticus about not getting tattooed in the manner of the dead while we are ignoring verses about not wearing fabric of mixed thread, polyester, should be outlawed, <laughs> right? But, we, but we'll do that. We'll eat meat of mixed breed when the Bible clearly states don't eat meat of mixed breed, right? We do, in a sense, pick and choose, and we understand there is an old covenant and there is a new covenant, but here's the reality is that the Bible is messy, it's messy. It's messy with uh, the way it tells stories because the Bible is God's words in human words. 
Now hear this correctly, because sometimes when we've talked about our 66 books of the Bible, or in different traditions, 72 books of the Bible, you're like, well, it's 66. No, it's 72. It's 72. No, it's 66. Um, we can't even decide how many books we want in this thing. And, and yet we hold it up as if this is the only truth there is. Jesus Christ is the only truth. And so when we come to this, we have to understand its job. And its job is precisely to be messy. Sometimes we think the Bible was written in a holy haze. Can you picture the scene? The saint, whoever is writing it, all of these authors, right? It's not one author. All these authors are sitting at their desk or in a prison cell, Paul, or wherever the writing is occurring. And they're sitting there, and with one hand, they're writing the, these words of God. And with the other hand, they're Googling what it means to have a Bible, right? They're eating a ham sandwich. Well, probably not. Most of them were Jews. Um, they're... Uh, Right, they're doing whatever. They're they're waving to their friends. They're 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 doing whatever as if their writing hand is moving of its own volition. It's not. God always speaks to His creation through creation. Isn't that great? And that means that sometimes even the voice of God gets a little messy, because our lives are messy. Scripture is messy. It's not a tidy book. It is a book that includes someone getting chopped up and FedExed all over the known world at the time, right? Judges. Wow, Judges is a rough book, right? It is a book that deals with every aspect of life from the marriage bed to the death bed and beyond that. It deals with all of this. And our lives are messy and the Bible is messy too, so, we come to passages even like what Paul says. When he says, now I'm writing this, this is not me speaking, this is, or this is not the Lord speaking, this is me speaking. And we come to these passages and we go, okay, but this is Paul speaking, but this is Paul speaking in the Bible. <laughs> so when Paul says, it's not the Lord speaking, it's me speaking, but it's in the Bible, what do we do with that? You ever have these problems that keep you up at night or am I the only one? Uh, see, we tend to freak out about some of these things, um, and, 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 and we don't know what to do with them, and we get defensive, and we become internet trolls as a response to that oftentimes. Um, but, uh, but, but we come to these things, and we say, wait, it's in the Bible, so I should believe and do everything that it says, even then when our lives don't believe and do everything it says. Here's what I want you to get today. The Bible is not a manual for how to live life. It's a story, not a fiction. Don't hear story and think fiction, fairy tale. It's a narrative. It's not a manual. Here's the problem with thinking of the Bible as a manual for living. If I have an appliance, a dishwasher, I have four dishwashers. I'm a blessed man. Um, <laughs> Right. If I have a dishwasher and I, I install it and, uh, and I want this dishwasher to run like it should, what I'm going to do is pull out a manual and I'm going to read through it in, in theory. I, I, I don't read manuals. Like, why would I do that? But I'm going to read through this thing. And, and if I do this, if I do everything right, startup procedures, if I load it right, if I put the soap in the dispenser right, if I do everything according to the manual, it's going to run like it should. Everything's going to work right. And when we treat the Bible like a manual for living, we end up with this false narrative that if I do this, my life is just going to go like it should. And we miss the point. The Bible is messy because we're messy. Amen. And so we can't see it like that. I want you to see it like a story. I ran across this poem. It was written by a pastor in St. Joe, Missouri. Um, Saint, uh, Saint. I almost called him Saint. That would have been a heresy. He's not dead yet. Um, but uh, um, Brian Zond, and if you've read any of his books, you know Saint is probably not in the title. Um, but Brian Zond uh, wrote this poem, and I want to read, read it to you. It's, it's a little long, so bear with me, but it's good. He says, the Bible, it's a story. 
We're telling news here. We're keeping alive an ancient epic, the grand narrative of paradise lost and paradise regained, the greatest once upon a time tale ever told, the beautiful story uh, uh, which moves relentlessly toward and they lived happily ever after. Never, never, never forget that before it's anything else, it's a story. So let the story live and let it breathe, let it enthrall and enchant. Don't rip out its guts and leave it lifeless on the dissecting tables. Don't make it something it's really not, a catalog of wished-for promises, an encyclopedia of God facts, a law journal of divine edicts, a how-to manual for do-it-yourselfers. Find the promises, learn the facts, heed the laws, live the lessons, but don't forget... It's a story. Learn to read the book for what it is, God's great, big, wild, and wonderful surprise ending love story. So let there be wonder. Let there be mystery. Let there be tragedy. Let there be heartbreak. Let there be suspense. Let there be surprise. Let there be earthy. Let it be earthy and human. Let it be celestial and divine. Let it be what it is. And don't try to make it perfect where it's not. This fantastic story of creation and alienation, devastation and incarnation, salvation and restoration with its cast of thousands is more Tolstoy than a thousand-page sermon. It's a story because we are not saved by ideas. We are saved by an event. Here's a plot line for you. Death burial and resurrection. Yes, that's the story. It's not a plan. It's not an ology. It's not an ism. It's a story. And it's an amalgamated patchwork story told in a mixed medium, narration and history, genealogy and prophecy, poetry and parable, psalm and song and sermon and dream and vision and memoir and letter. So understand the medium and don't try so hard to miss the point. Try to learn what matters and what doesn't. It's not where and when Job lived, but what Job learned in his painful odyssey and poetic theodicy. It's not how many cubits of water you need to put Everest under a flood, but why the world was so dirty that it needed such a big bath. Trying to find Noah's Ark instead of trying to rid the world of violence really is an exercise in missing the point. Speaking of missing the point, it's not did the snake talk, but what did the stupid thing say? Because he did not say stupid. Hmm. Because even though I've never met a talking snake, I've sure had serpentine thoughts crawl into my head. Hmm. Literalism is a kind of escapism by which you move out of the crosshairs of the probing questions, but parable and metaphor, Jesus' way, have a way of knocking us to the floor. Prose, flattened literalism makes, makes the story small, time-confined and irrelevant, but poetry and allegory travel through time and space to get in our face. Inert facts are easy enough to set on the shelf, but the story well told will haunt you. Ah, the story well told. That's what is needed. It's time for the story to burst out of the cage and take the stage and demand a hearing once again. It's a story, I tell you. And if you allow the story to seep into your life so that the story begins to weave into your story, that's when at last, my friend, you're reading the Bible for the first time. Isn't that good? This is the invitation. It's this story that, that, that isn't there just so you learn facts. It's a story told to invite you into the narrative to become part of it. This is always what Jesus' life did. It was always an invitation. And this is what Scripture does. Scripture's purpose is not the Bible verse that we pull out and use to tell others how wrong they are. Scripture's purpose is an invitation to invite all into the story, the narrative of God's redeeming purpose. Amen. We have got to remember that because sometimes we place Scripture in such a position that we have seen the author of Scripture as, as, as something more than the person of Scripture. So scripture itself becomes its own thing, in a sense becomes its own God. But scripture apart from God is just 
a book. So we come to this passage this morning. Abby read it with us. Uh, you recited some of the words. So here's, here's how this works. It's post-resurrection. Jesus shows up in the upper room, the same upper room. Everyone's up there. The disciples are up there. They're locked up there because they're afraid. They've heard the stories. The women have gone to the tomb. Some of them reported that they have seen Jesus. And at this point in Luke chapter 24, there's a couple of other disciples, Cleopas and his companion, who, and this is commentary, I think was his wife, um, many say, see, see them as two male companions, but, uh, but in the Greek, they're arguing, they're bickering. I think they were married. And they were, going, and they were going to the same house. Like, that's a little weird. Why are they going to the same house? They, they were going to the same house. I think they were married. Um, but Jesus shows up. Do you remember this story? Post-resurrection. No one has really seen Jesus except Mary Magdalene in John's gospel. This is Luke, though, and Luke has reported no sightings. So they're walking on this road, seven-mile journey to Emmaus, and Jesus shows up, and he's like, um, he comes up, and they're arguing, they're bickering, that's what the Greek says, they're talking back and forth very excitedly about what's going on, and Jesus walks up and says, so, what's going on? <laughs> like, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, have you not heard? Where have you been? Have you had your head under a rock? Do you not know what's going on in Jerusalem? In other words, Everyone knew what was going on. Who is this guy and why doesn't he know? And Jesus plays coy, and I love this. He's like, no, I haven't heard anything. Tell me. Isn't that great? Jesus totally manipulated the situation. Passive-aggressive Jesus. And, uh, <laughs> and so, so there he is, and they're like, and so they told him everything, and, and, uh, and, and so he does this amazing thing. We don't get the details, but he does this Bible study. It says he then proceeded to explain to them all of Scripture and how it all pointed to these things. They didn't know it was Jesus, still didn't know it was Jesus. It wasn't until they got to dinner and they invited him in. It says Jesus acted as if he was going on to the next town so that he would get an invitation for dinner. I love that. He's totally playing these people. And uh, he gets invited over to dinner, and, um, and it says while he was breaking bread. They recognized him. Their eyes were open. I think maybe, I don't know, I think maybe they saw the stars. I don't know. But he disappeared from their sight. And they're, they're in amazement. So they run back to Jerusalem, seven miles, as fast as they can. It's in the dark. This is not a safe journey. They run back. They're, they find the disciples in the upper room, locked, doors locked. The disciples are afraid. The 11 are there. And they go in and uh, they tell him everything that has happened. And this is kind of where we pick up the story. It says, while they were talking about these things, all of a sudden, Jesus appeared to them. And so here's, there's, this is where we pick up the story. There's three things I want you to hear in this passage that we've read. And I'm not going to reread the passage. But here's the three things, and then we'll, we'll tease them out just a little bit. The first point is, the Bible is not God's truth for the world. It is God's truth for the kingdom of God. Okay, that's the first point. Here's the second point. The Bible is the full revelation of Jesus. All of Scripture is about Jesus. Here's the third point. The Bible is narrative, and the narrative goes like this. Repentance, forgiveness, mission. Ah. So here we go. The first point, the Bible is not God's truth for the world. Here, here's what was amazing when I was reading this. Um, they're talking about everything that has happened. And it says, it says in, my, in my translation, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you kind of funny. If you're in a locked room and no one else is getting in and some dude just shows up and then turns around and says, peace, <laughs> is peace what you'd be thinking? No. You'd be thinking, how do I change a robe that I've wet? <laughs> like, hey, like, this scares me. Um, but we're all in robes and does it work the same way as pants? You know, I don't know. These are the questions that plague me. Um, but uh, Jesus, Jesus says, peace, peace be with you. Um, and, and, and here is the thing that, that, that kind of rattled my cage as I was reading this. I wrote, you ever write a line down and then you look at it and go, ooh, I wish I hadn't written that or wish I hadn't thought that. And here, here was what I wrote down. I said, you cannot talk your way into the truth. 
And I went, ooh. I mean, that's my job. You cannot talk your way into the truth. They were just talking about all of these things. You can't talk your way into the truth. You need Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. There's no talking your way into it. You cannot convince yourself of something you don't believe. You just can't do it. You can't. What what belief requires, what faith requires is the person of Jesus. And this is true even with Scripture. Um, You cannot talk yourself into believing the Word of God. You must believe the Word of God who is incarnated in Jesus so that you can believe the Word of God that has been written on the pages of Scripture. That's how it works. You don't believe the Bible and then believe in Jesus. That's why I'm saying the Bible is not God's truth for the world. Now, don't get me wrong. Would the world be a better place if we lived by the precepts of the Bible? Yes, it absolutely would be. But guess what? If we evangelize the world by trying to preach or trying to teach them that the Bible is what they need to live by, they could live by that and still miss Jesus. You see, our hope is not in what the Bible says. Our hope is in what Jesus says. And Jesus then speaks the words of Scripture into our life. We've got to get this in the right order. The Bible is not God's truth for the world. I, I, this, I've wrestled with how to say this. And I'm choosing my words very carefully this morning. Even though for many of your ears it sounds like I'm, I'm being very radical. Um, but, but we've got to understand this. We have got to stop insisting that the world outside of the church live by the Bible and instead start insisting that the church live by the precepts of Scripture. You see, what the world needs is not to be convinced of the reality of Scripture. What the world needs is to be convinced of the transformational power of Christ that has transformed the people of God who live by the precepts of Scripture so that the world can see that there is something better, something different, something right and righteous. The world does not need the Bible. The world needs the church to live by the Bible. Does that make sense? It's hard for us to think because if you're like me, you have used this Bible in wrong ways. I have. I have. I've sniped people with this Bible. I've pulled out my verses and told them just how wrong they are because of words in this when all along it should have been pointed at me. Right? This word is not for the world. It's for the church, and we cannot talk our way into a relationship with Christ. Um, it, we, we cannot convince ourselves simply by reading Scripture that, that Jesus is the Christ. What we need is the living Spirit to breathe in our lives so that the living Word of God will come alive in our lives. We've got to get this in the right order. I think maybe it's time we stop defending the Bible and start living it. Hmm. Maybe we need to be more silent about what its pages say and more evident in our actions of what they actually mean. Maybe it's time to quit quoting verses outside of these doors. I don't know. It, this sounds radical, but the, the point of Scripture, the point of this narrative is the radical transformation that it brings about. Um, I've wondered about this. How often do we try to convince someone of the reality of Christ by proving the authority of the Bible? Well, if you don't believe in Christ, you're not going to believe in Scripture. <laughs> right? So, well, you don't believe in Christ? Well, good. Let me quote you a Bible verse. Let, let's walk through the Romans road. <laughs> right? It doesn't work. Oh, there's moments. There's moments. I get, I get it. There's moments, but understand that's God's provenient grace. It's nothing you've said. You're not that convincing when you open these, these pages. It's nothing you said. It's God's spirit going before you, God's spirit preparing the ground, God's spirit speaking through you. If someone responds even to our fallacious, uh, fallacious, even to our false narratives, even to the clumsy way we speak, if, if they respond to it, they're not responding to you. They're responding to God. You see, and here's the point. Have you ever seen where God uses you in spite of yourself? (laughs) Ha ha. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Like, I should not have made a joke about holding a baby up and sniffing its butt. 
Like, that's church. You don't say that. But, hey, but, but here's the reality is sometimes God uses us even in our foolishness. And here's the thing you need to know about Scripture. It's messy just like us. And sometimes even where the authors, oh, maybe they got a battle date wrong. That happens all through First and Second Kings. Maybe they got the number of soldiers wrong. Oh, we can read the differences between First Chronicles and, 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 and First Kings, and we can compare them. We go, wait a second, that's the same battle. It's two different troop numbers. What, what's the deal? Maybe, maybe in spite of the human authors, God still speaks in infallible ways. You see, this is what Scripture is. When we say it's living and it's active and it's breathing, it's not because it's perfect to every letter. It's not because it's perfect to every, every period and comma. It's not because it's perfect even, even in its original manuscripts. It's precisely because God speaks in miraculous ways through broken people. That's the miracle of Scripture and the miracle of Scripture that God has preserved through these ages. It's amazing when we find these early fragments of Scripture and we compare them to our modern translations, what is astounding is how little has changed through the centuries. God has preserved His Word. He's preserved it, but He has preserved it for the church. The Bible is not God's truth for the world. It is God's truth for the church. And if it's not truth for us, for me, then how dare we make it truth for others? You see, what the world needs are Christians who believe what they say and do what they believe. Amen. That's what the world needs. So the Bible is not for the world. It is for the church. Here's the second thing. The Bible is the revelation of of Jesus. Look at this. Um, we, we see this again all throughout, but Jesus, when he begins to speak to these disciples, he said to them, uh, verse 44, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Notice he said everything written about me in the Old Testament. Well, what was written about Jesus in the Old Testament? Do you ever hear this phrase? Well, we need to go back to a simple, literal reading of Scripture. Okay? If we took a literal reading of Jesus' words, he's wrong. Not one word was written about Jesus in the Old Testament. Not one word. We're like, well, but there's prophecies about the Messiah. Yeah, but Je this is Jesus, not some figure. This is Jesus, not one word. Here's what he's saying. He's saying it's not about fulfilling a bunch of prophecies, though he did all of that. He says all of the narrative brings all of creation to me. It's all about me. Not this verse, not that verse, not this little thing from Isaiah about a virgin birth, not that little thing from Isaiah about uh, being born in the town of Bethlehem and Ephraim, not this little thing from Isaiah 53 about uh, dying a, a horrible death, not just these verses, right? It's not, a, he's saying all of scriptures. Notice he says the law of Moses, it's Torah, uh, Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Five books. All of that, he says, is about Jesus. All of the law, uh, the law of Moses, he says, and then all of the Psalms. Well, some of these Psalms are near blasphemous. Near blasphemous. How's that about Jesus? Don't you love Psalm 39? Um, uh, Psalm 39, I love that one. It's, it's near blasphemy. It starts off by saying, God, I, I remember those days when, um, when I could look at the world and I could smile. I was happy and life seemed to be going good. Um, then it all went sideways on me. I, you do know I'm paraphrasing. Okay, I figured I better throw that out there. Um, and then it all went sideways on me. And so I said, it said at first, well, I'm going to proclaim your glory, and my life still stunk. And so then I said, well, I'm going to put my hand over my mouth. I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to bite my tongue, and my life still stunk. And he gets all the way through this, and at the very end, he says, turn, turn away from me, God, that I might smile again. That's not how a psalm should end. It's in the Bible. Like, God, ever since you smiled upon me, my life has been lousy. So quit it. Right? 
Jesus says, even the Psalms, it's about me, he says. It's all about him. You see, you can't pull that verse out and say, well, see, that was predicting Jesus. No, Jesus is saying it's the narrative. The narrative brings us to this point that it all points to me. Every part of it from creation to exile to the expulsion outside of the garden to the depravity of sin to the wandering in the wilderness to the enslavement uh, to, the, uh, to the redemption of God's people into the land of promise and then they messed up again and back into captivity for 70 years and, 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 and they almost forgot what they knew but God's grace was there and restores them and brings them back but even when he brings them back more conquerors come in and now they're not marched off now they become captives in their own land and all of this is pointing to a messiah who will come and redeem he says it's all about me it's a story it's a story and you've got to find yourself in the story the bible is the revelation of jesus doubt diminishes in the presence of jesus like if he showed up in the flesh right now Would you doubt any longer? Well, according to Scripture, some of us would. That's what happened, Matthew chapter 28. They worshiped and some doubted. The worshipers doubted. The doubters worshiped. Um, So even then, it seems like some of us would still doubt. But I found when Jesus is present, doubt diminishes. Where Jesus is absent, doubt increases. We often treat the Bible as the proof of Jesus, but we've got it backwards. The Bible is not the proof about Jesus. Jesus is the proof of Scripture. Here is the reality. You can have your doubts about Scripture, about its fallibility or about its infallibility, but it means nothing if Christ is not present. Nobody, the Bible has no authority if the Christian has no Christ. Come on, that should have gotten a groan. The Bible has no authority if the Christian has no Christ. If we're so concerned about the authority of Scripture, maybe it's because we've lost the presence of Christ in our communities of faith. The Bible does not need a defense, it needs a disciple. It needs disciples. See, the Bible is the revelation of Jesus. And we, uh, the body of Christ, the church, is the body of Christ. We are the tangible reality of Christ in the world right now. Scripture is what guides us. But the body of Christ is what does the work outside of the church So here we are. Uh, The Bible is not God's truth for the world. It is God's truth for the church. The Bible is the revelation of Jesus. And then finally this, the Bible is narrative. And Jesus tells us what that narrative is. Let me read it to you again. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And then he says, You are witnesses of these things. You see, he opened their minds, verse 45 tells us, he opened their minds to understand Scripture and then says those words. All of Scripture, he says, testifies to this narrative, repentance, forgiveness, mission. This is the story of the church. It's not repentance, forgiveness, heaven. That's the wrong order. It's not repentance, forgiveness, cloistered lives. That's the wrong order. It's repentance, forgiveness, mission. If you repent and your path is changed, if you believe and forgive, that forgiveness can be received, then your life will take on a new shape, a new mission. It will look completely different. And the world will see that. Your life will become a scripture of sorts for the world to read. You see, the Bible is nothing more, apart from Christ and the spirit that indwells us, the Bible is nothing more than a collection of books that have been written in the language of time, culture, and and location. The miracle of the Bible is not that God wrote God's words on parchment apart from human participation. Instead, the miracle of the Bible is that God spoke into the lives of ancient believers the truth of God, and the human writers then spoke into the life of the culture in which they lived. 
You see, this is what Scripture is. Scripture is speaking right into the culture of the people that wrote it. They're speaking with their language, their metaphors, their examples, right into that culture. We have got to be careful sometimes when we take this Bible and we pull out our verses, we rip it out of its context and we do a profanity to Scripture and to the name of Christ. You see, sometimes words are spoken that, that belong to the culture Amen. and not outside of it. Some of you have been in the church long enough to remember the to-do about how women should do their hair. Right? Some of you should be short, should be long, should be up in buns, right? All of this stuff. And then uh, society perverted that so much that now men wear buns. <laughs> no. No, that is not cool. Um, and and I, I wish I could grow my hair long enough to wear a bun and just to show you how uncool it is. But when I grow my hair long, it just curls up and it forms a bun on its own in the back and I look like a Mennonite woman. Um, <laughs> but you see, you see... The Bible speaks so often right into culture, and, and we're like, but it's timeless. It is timeless, but it's also very timely, it, it, both in where it was written and how it's applied to our life. The Bible is messy. We're, we're over from some of our passages. We are at least 2,000 years removed. From others, we're like 3,500 years removed from them, and we have got to remember that with every day, our culture shifts, and we have the job of translating Scripture to the world, not, trans, not Scripture translating itself to the world. The church is to speak with the authority of God outside these doors. You are the living Bible, the living Word of God. This is why Jesus said to his disciples, whatever you bind on earth will be bound, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose. And whatever you bind in heaven will be bound. And whatever you loose in heaven will be loosed. You see, you are both the binding and the loosing of the people around you. How you treat scripture, how we believe the word of God, how we live it out, how we, how we engage in this mission is how they will see God's truth. Amen. And when we are bound by false narratives... We bind the people around us. But when we are set free by true narratives, others around us are set free. You see, this is the narrative. It is repentance. It is forgiveness. It is mission, repentance. We talk often about this. This is this idea. It's a total life change. One direction, now you're heading in a new direction. And it's not just a, a reversal on the same path. It's a new path altogether. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. We walk ye in this way. Walk ye in this truth. Um, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so here's the point of Scripture is, is, is that it is, it is God's vehicle for the Christian to the world around us, and it begins in repentance, a change of direction. When the world sees how radically, uh, how radically love has transformed us, it will be transformed radically by that love. It is a message of forgiveness notice repentance comes before forgiveness isn't that weird we thought we forgiveness should come first and then repentance but it's repentance and then forgiveness because here's the reality in christ you are already forgiven you just need to receive it and that forgiveness is on that path you have already been forgiven father forgive them for they know not what they do god has already forgiven you you need to walk in the path where that is becomes more and more of the reality of the path that you walk in and then finally mission where he says you will be this my name will be proclaimed in all of the nations you see it's not about, about just dying and going to heaven it's not about getting right so we can get our smoke insurance or our fire insurance with God. It's about getting right so we can become part of the story. That's what mission is. Mission is engaging in the narrative. Here's what we find out about Scripture. is Scripture doesn't end. We don't add books to the Bible. We don't take books out of the Bible. But Scripture doesn't end just because Revelation 22 has come to a close. Scripture doesn't end because the church keeps going into the world. You become the living embodiment of the Word of God. 
Um, and, and, and so what this is, is this Bible is a way for God's transformed kingdom to look like something very different than the world in which it is situated, to look alien, to look foreign. It is a Bible that talks about peace rather than conflict. You're like the Old Testament has a lot of conflict. It's a story. I'm not saying it's a false story, but like any narrative, the narrative grows. Just because you get to the end of the book doesn't mean everything in the front end of the book is what you should apply to your life right now. It's a narrative. That violence, that that bloodshed, those things that seem to uh, define who we are as humans, Jesus came and said, no, my kingdom looks different. You've grown beyond that, that kind of violence. And Peter tried it once. Remember, he went swinging with a sword, but he swung that sword like he was a fisherman. And rather than cutting off the dude's head, he cut off his ear. You think he was aiming for his ear? He wasn't. He was just that bad at the sword right? And he cut off the dude's ear and Jesus said, no, this is not what my kingdom looks like. And he stoops down and picks up the ear and he heals him. That's what God's kingdom looks like. You see, it's a different kingdom. It's a transformed kingdom. The problem with with the Bible is not the Bible itself. It is the Bible believers who profess belief in the authority of scripture, but continue to live as if the story of repentance, forgiveness, and mission are inconsequential. So here we come to the end of all of this. What is the Bible? Do we doubt the word of God? No. We do not doubt the word of God. But do we need to defend it? No. We need to be transformed by it. This is what the world is waiting for. The world is not waiting for you to prove to them that the Bible is without error. The the world is waiting for you to prove to them that the words of Scripture have transformed your life through the power of Christ, and it will transform them, theirs as well. This is good news, good news. If you've ever doubted the integrity of Scripture, you're not alone. And we don't need to make some dogmatic claims this morning to bolster our own ego. Instead, we rely upon the grace of Jesus Christ, the presence of God's Spirit, and the truth of his word living in us.